So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Joy. Uh, I'm just a graduate from USC School of Architecture, and now I'm working at MicroDesk. Uh, start from this week, actually. So, I'm going to uh, uh, moderate this session uh, uh, with uh, three outstanding presentations. So, the first one will be Beam and Automated Plan Review from Mark Clinton, uh, CEO of Smart Review, and James Halliburton from. Uh, uh, principle of uh, SDH architecture. The second one will be historical 3D reconstructions, beam and uh, metadata from Dr. Christine Tanton, a uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Digital Research and Education, UCLA, and uh, Anthony uh, Cadwell, assistant director from UCLA, uh, and uh, Experimental Technology Center and manager of the uh, Scholar Innovations Labs of UCLA. So the third one will be uh, plugging into the owner's mind with beam and game-changing innovation from uh, Stephen Hagen, uh, President and CEO of Hagen Technologies. So uh, after that, there will be 20 minutes break. So uh, please welcome uh, the first uh, pre presenter, uh, Mark Clinton and James Halliburton. Hello, everybody. Uh, um, it's great to be here. I want to thank Karen uh, and, uh, and Doug, especially, for all the uh, work they've done putting together, as well as the many student workers. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing. So, BIM and Automated Plan Review. Um, I'm a faculty member at Texas A&M University. Uh, James is also on the faculty at Texas A&M University. But we also wear other hats. So James is a principal in the uh, firm of uh, SZH um, in Bryan College Station that does, uh, does architecture work in the, in the region. Uh, and I'm the CEO of a, a small software company called Smart Review. And our company is trying to fill a hole in, uh, in BIM analysis by addressing building code analysis. So we're gonna talk about the building code analysis as what's next, right? So uh, James is gonna take over and tell you about the theory. We figured the practitioners should talk about theory and I'll talk about practice. So. Thanks, Mark. So everyone had a good lunch, so you're all real sleepy. So uh, we're gonna interject a little levity at times just to try to have some fun. So today we're gonna to talk about BIM and automated plane review. So everyone's kind of, I think, familiar with this, uh, this graphic, right? So wherever you fall on the innovation continuum, teaching, practicing, researching, uh, you're interfacing with some portion of this relationship, right? If you're, if you're using BIM, you're, you're doing some of these things, right? Depending on the goals in any setting on your design projects or, or what you're working on, one or more of these relationships takes priority, right? So in my, in my practice, most of my clients just assume I make buildings that don't fall down. But in reality, what we really want to do is ensure that they get a building that is uh, energy efficient, cost effective, uh, structurally sound as well, it's one small part. Um, we want to make sure all the stakeholders have a successful business, that they're making a profit, right? as bad as it is to say that. Right? And uh, we want to deliver that project on time. So all of those things go into this. What doesn't? What we don't do at the moment, and what we're trying to do, is figure out how do we get building code analysis into this, into this um, design process. So at a um, presentation we had at, at Texas A&M this year, one of the presenters said, everyone knows that building code is the least building you can design. And everyone laughed and we thought it was funny. But in reality, it is the least building you can design. Right? So it's kind of the emphasis on, on the right word there. You have to be, if we're gonna do, if we're gonna design buildings and make places for people, they have to meet some sort of code, right? We have to ensure the health, safety, and welfare. So this is a really important thing. And, and we can, we're working this into a process. It becomes part of the process, just like all of these other factors in our iterative BIM design process. So I kind of like to think about this as uh, looking at old process, new process, kind of looking at the continuum. And one of, one of my favorite comic strips as a kid, uh, Calvin Hobbes, and this, is, this one has always stuck with me, especially after I started architecture school. 
right? And I didn't get permission from Bill Larson to put this up here, so hopefully he's okay with it. Because I think it illustrates a really great point, right? So how do we, we don't design buildings and hope they don't fall down, right? We, we have a pretty sophisticated analysis process for all these things that we do, right? So why, why is building code any different? Why isn't building code part of this iterative process so that we are getting some tacit knowledge out of this, right? So this kind of old school process where you might do one or two iterations with your design because the, it was a labor intensive process, you make a change based on intuition and you can't really, it's a hard time evaluating whether that change is gonna be successful until you build it. So we're, we're away from that now. And we're in a new process where, as we've seen today, at least I've seen in this room, we're evaluating all of these things in simulations, right? And we're building this knowledge base of all of these parts of the design process all the way through, right? And we think building code should be right in there with it. And we're all doing this, we're doing building code at the same time that we're evaluating all these other things. So we're looking at occupant safety, construction type, all these things as we're doing our building design. It's not just something that we kind of outline at the beginning and then fill in the code review sheet at the end of the project. So we want to create a new process. We want to, this, this new process will add value to our building design process. That's the goal, right? So our new process is you, you create a BIM and you, know, you check all those other things too, like structural analysis, energy analysis, right? And then you check the BIM against building codes and you revise and correct, right? And then you watch, rinse and repeat, and you keep going until your designs, as they evolve and, and go through the, building, or the design process, right? Until so you, you've got a code compliant building. Right? And then you, you produce a certified plan review, you give it to the authority, you pay your fee, you get your building permit. Right? So this is kind of the, the vision of the future. This will be, this is what's coming tomorrow. Right? So let's compare that to what we kind of do now, right? where we create drawings, we undertake a manual check of the drawings, right? we submit the drawings to the AHJ, you wait six weeks if you're lucky, and then you get, you receive a list of corrections, you revise and resubmit, and you wash and rinse and repeat until you've caught all of the, satisfied all the code issues, right? And in a small municipality, Bryan College Station, that could be, in the city of Bryan, that could be two weeks, in the city of College Station, that could be 12 weeks or more, right? So it's, it varies greatly, I'm sure in larger cities, um, it takes a little more time, right? And everyone, since everyone loves working with the code review officials, this, this is really a great model, right? No? Okay. So anyway, then you pay your fee and you receive your building permit. So if you think about it, where is, where is the most time in this? How are we adding value to this process? How much time does it take to get that list of corrections, fix all those things, turn them back in, wait, 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 right? The previous process, you're doing all that review in your own office. You're doing all that review with, within your BIM. You're seeing the effects of these changes and hopefully you're addressing all of these code issues prior to submission, right? So we think, we think this adds an extreme amount of value to a project. Because think about, it, all stakeholders have a value, everyone involved in this process, right? As much as we, you know, we don't wanna talk about making a profit. From architects, from a practitioner perspective, it allows me to, to spend less time revising things for the AHJ, right? For the AHJ, it's less backlog of projects, right? They're, they're getting projects that are, are approved or not approved, but they're, they're certified to meet code, and then their review is, could be less, right? Uh, the owner, my gosh, this has enormous value impacts to the owner. Uh, if you can tell your client that, yeah, it used to be 12 to 16 weeks for a building permit, I can get you one in a week, right? Or a day even, right? It has value to the government because we can, we can move people into projects quicker, right? So they can get <coughs> tax rates, they can start charging tax over a quicker amount of time, right? So this is a value to everyone. So at this point, I think we're gonna, we're gonna kind of start going through a little bit of um, how this works. We're gonna kind of do a demo and Mark's gonna walk you through a demo and we'll, we'll talk about it and kind of walk through what goes on here. Um, there's just a few things needed for this. Right, I'm gonna pass this back to Mark and let him kind of take this over. Okay, so, um, so I, I just wanted to just drive home that point on the value. You know, think about the value here. So on one hand, we're, we're helping the architects get to a compliant building faster, so that's valuable. 
for relieving them from the incredible tedium. How many people out there like checking the building code, reading building codes? Anybody likes this? We got one person who likes. We got two masochists up there who like uh, reading building codes. Um, but um, so so we're helping helping the architect uh, have a happier life too, let's say. But uh, but then the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction, um, we're helping them relieve their backlog for one thing, uh, and be more confident that the building has been checked thoroughly uh, for another. The building owner, the really important thing is that if you think of something like like Target, uh, Target did a study a while back, and they said that they uh, they estimate they lose $200 million a year waiting for permits. Okay, so it is valuable to a building owner to move into the building faster so they can start operating faster, bringing in their profit if they're a business faster, you know, get to market faster, everything. It's extremely valuable to them. And the government is in the same situation. If you move into the building faster, you get sales tax revenues faster, you get property tax revenues faster, you get all of that stuff faster. So, so, the, so, so it's, it's interesting to see that building codes, we know they're a big bottleneck for the industry, but to understand how important they are and how much value there is, and if we can eliminate all of the friction of building codes, then we could add a lot of value in the industry. Um, so uh, so we've, we're working to do that through automating the plan review process. And, um, and we've built some software that lets us uh, check a gravit model against the International Building Code. So, uh, and we found that actually, um, uh, well, um, we focused on, on a handful of chapters in the IBC that seem most relevant to what architects do uh, in terms of form making. So chapter five, which is about heights and areas. Uh, chapter six, which is about construction types. Uh, chapter seven, which is finishes, and chapter eight, I don't remember. Um, uh, chapter 10 is means of egress. And, and those are largely what architects, you know, when, we, when we lay out the building, decide the size of it, uh, decide how it's gonna be constructed, assembled, the layout of the room and stuff, uh, that's, that's most, those chapters are the most important ones, arguably. Um, now we found that by uh, labeling the, or including in the design the property lines, the floors, the walls, the roofs, the windows, the doors, the rooms, and the areas, so these are area separations, um, we could do a pretty extensive check of the building. So a fairly small subset of information to do that. Now, um, now the way we're checking it is, uh, is, is, is fairly what's become a fairly typical model of a cloud service here where we have a, uh, a client that runs inside of Revit. It collects a bunch of information, sends it across the internet. You know, if you're a technical guy, then you might be interested. We use XML to send the information. Um, we catch it on our cloud analysis service and we apply the building code checks on the cloud service. We package the information, send it back to the client to display to the user. So it looks like it's all in Revit, but it's actually going across the, across the internet to the cloud. You can also get at the cloud service from a web browser. So if you want to inspect old reports or um, uh, how many reports you did, statistics, analytics, you can do it from the web browser. But um, that's basically, how it works, and I have a reputation for, uh, for giving demos uh, in presentations, live demos, and um, it's dangerous, but I don't know, I live dangerously, right? So, um, so uh, now I wanna start with this little building, and I know it's a stupid, dumb little building, but it's not unusual for small town architects to do buildings like this. Um, so, uh, and there are a lot of small town architects out there. So, so think of this as a little insurance office, and uh, uh, you know, and I, and I highlight what um, uh, what you need to have in the building. So, roof, walls, doors, windows, floors, all that stuff. And uh, and once I have that information, I can uh, I can run a plan review. Um, 
well, I'm going to change it slightly here. I like to go to this view. And I'm going to run the plan review, and it extracted some information from Revit, and uh, I can edit that information. I can change um, things like the, uh, the frontage situation. I can look at the fire separation, the distance from the wall to the uh, uh, property line. I could change fire ratings and stuff. Um, uh, I can put in occupant loads, and I may have the occupant loads wrong in here. Yeah, right. It is not a daycare. It's a business. Business occupancy, so let's go to business and apply. And it recalculated the um, occupant load for me. Well, let's do them all at once. So it, so it redid the occupant load. Um, and uh, well, you know, I could look at more of these things. It's figured out where the exit discharge doorway is, which ones are egress doors. Um, you know, it's, you know, but it's much more interesting just to run, run an analysis and see what we get. If I messed up, of course, the software hopefully is gonna find that I messed up and tell me about it. So, um, so here it is. Our chapter five is just fine. The building areas are fine. Chapter six, uh, don't have any problem with that. The types of construction. Chapter seven has a problem. And that's uh, the allowable area of openings. And I can uh, scroll down here and see that the east wall has a problem. Uh, it's only 2.88 feet from the property line and it's got a bunch of windows in it and that's not allowed. So the software found that problem in error. Now, um, now you can see that the software is presenting the information um, in the context of the building code. So it basically takes the building code and annotates it with the analysis, not just the errors, but the, the uh, compliance as well, so compliance and failures. Now, in a little more subtle way, see back here that it highlighted the stuff in Revit too. So, uh, so these wall, let's change this wall to red and this door to red, and I'll fix those in a minute. And then there's one other way to look at the model. I can look at it in terms of architecture and see um, a uh, door swing here or, or that wall and see the explanation. So it's, uh, you know, I find it easier to browse the building in terms of the walls, windows, floors, roofs, rather than the building code. Now my building code, my partners are building code officials, they find it easier to look at it in terms of the IBC. But they're kind of strange that way, you know. Um, but, um, so, so it's told me what I need to change, and, uh, and I can change this really fast. This door, it's only 30 inches wide, and it needs to be wider. Let's just make it 36 inches wide. Um, and this wall over here, um, you know, I can start deleting windows, but, uh, but I know from experience that there are no windows allowed when you're that close. So I'm going to do a little cheat here, and I'm going to move the property line. You don't really get to do that <laughs> in the real world, but I am an academic after all, right? So uh, I'm going to unpin that, and I'm going to pick this property line, and I'm going to pull it out some and basically reposition the building and then run it again and um, takes a minute sending it across the cloud server uh, to the cloud server uh, it's done uh, i look in architecture there's nothing in red so it passes now so uh so that you know that's a that's you know i do that as just kind of the illustration that what we see is the process that, that James showed a minute ago of, of iterating through the process several times until you get compliance. Um, now, um, now I know that's a, a kind of silly little building, and so we've got another silly little building to look at. Um, is um, is this little uh, silly little box of a, a hotel? But you know, I just wanted to increase the number of rooms and the complexity of layout. Um, and um, one of these days, we'll make a um, more sophisticated building. Uh, we'll, we'll do some parametric walls and some uh, nice curves and stuff, and it'll look cool. You know, but um, um, now one thing I wanted to show is that uh, one thing. 
is one kind of message to take away from this is that you know you can embed the information about building codes into your BIM and then make use of it in all sorts of ways. Whether you use you know our software or not, it the BIM becomes a powerful way to start illustrating uh, aspects of the building code. So uh, I can look at a floor plan and see the room um, rooms by name, but I can also look at the rooms by category. So these are the IBC room categories. Then we've got some uh, corridors, exit enclosures, rooms, um, and, they're, and they're highlighted so I can see it. I can look at the rooms by uh, finish classification. So, um, so the uh, exit enclosures here that enclose the stairs uh, need to be a type or a, a B finish classification, flame spread um, rating, uh, while the rest of the rooms can be a C or they are a C right now. Uh, I can look at the uh, function of space and see that there's uh, an assembly up here. Now this one is supposed to be an assembly because that's the little breakfast room. So, um, so I'm going to change it to assembly down here. Just so you can see that um, I'm simply editing these parameters in Revit and then the software can pull it out of Revit and do something with it. Um, Okay, now, um, let's see. Now, what I've been finding is that these kind of 3D views can be very useful. So this is an uh, open space, so this just shows me which walls are, are facing towards uh, uh, open space, which uh, affects uh, some aspects of the building code. Um, you know, fire separation is the distance to the... Um, distance to the uh, property line and so it's color coded by fire separation distance so I can you know very quickly see that I've got the right data in the model um, now uh, if I go ahead and run this this one's got a lot of problems as I recall so uh, I never know what the models have because I, I do a demonstration and I don't and then I save it Instead of throwing away that copy, um, but um, you know we can start an analysis and see what happens on this more complicated model. It takes a little bit longer to run, but it's still not not too bad. Um, yeah, and so, uh, so I've got a lot of problems with this. Uh, basically, uh, I, I think I've set it to be the wrong uh, construction type. If I go to concept here, I can change it to a 5A, which will be much better than a 5B. 5, 5B is only allowed to be two stories, and this is a four-story building. So um, I could show you that answer instead of waving my hands around, right? Um, but um, I see that the problem here is it's 42 feet tall and can only be 40 feet. Uh, the number of stories is also a problem. Um, and it's uh, type 5B is only allowed to have two stories. Uh, it doesn't have a sprinkler on either. So, um, so I can change, uh, change those things and, um, and run it again and get a little bit better results. So, so we're back to this process of iteratively exploring what the options are until we come into compliance. Um, now, um, now the real kind of, um, well, and you see there's still some problems, there are constru construction problems, some um, uh, egress problems here, um, and um, you no, know, but we could we could walk through them and, and, and fix them one by one and move on. Now, now the real thing I I want to kind of.
kind of seed this group with is thinking about, you know, back to what James was talking about, showing about a new process for building codes. So, um, so, um, you know, here's a question for you licensed architects out there. You know, the building code checks your, your design for compliance. Do they have any responsibility for that check? No. You're responsible anyway. And, um, and so, um, so I, I think there's a legitimate kind of argument to you do the check and you show them the report. And, uh, and if they want to spend their time checking your work, they can, but I think rapidly they're going to realize that that's not, that's not valuable to them. Uh, so, uh, so there was the kind of notion that, um, you know, a little while ago, the uh, presentation, they said they had, uh, I don't I don't remember how many hundred thousand drawings, right, in, uh, in, in pieces. I mean, we, we've produced reports that are uh, a couple thousand pages of code analysis uh, that, uh, that one could take to an AHJ and say, you know, we have checked everything. Um, and um, and so, so we're trying to get to envisioning a process where you as an architect check the code thoroughly by using software. You take, the, you take the report and your BIM and a PDF of drawings if they want that to the city or the authority having jurisdiction and, um, and they accept that process. Um, and uh, basically issue a permit um, over the counter. Now, this is a long-term vision. Right now, we check four, four chapters of the code, or five chapters of the code, not very much. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, uh, but being able to check some is a demonstration proof of concept that we could check a lot more. But, um, you know, I, um, I just want to open it up to, to questions and comments and tell us uh, you know, what you think. Yeah, question up here. Uh, well, so so the technically so the question is about the the colorization and and how that works in terms of the visualiza visualization of it. Is that what you're asking? Or? Oh, oh, a template. Uh, um, uh, I'm happy to give you my template, uh, so, uh, and, and you can actually download it from the from the, uh, the site. Now, uh, now the software is really uh, extremely preliminary, and so I know there's some problems in the template. So don't get angry at me if you find problems. You know, but uh, but uh, and, I, and I'll be doing doing some. Um, uh, YouTube training good things to show how to how to set up those templates to uh, work themselves. Yeah, I just want to want to add to that. When you first run that APR, it the the software adds parameters to all of the family objects in the file in the in your model. It it puts the data in that it needs in those objects, and you can edit that data either through the APR dialog or through the objects themselves in Revit. So when you see that long list of errors, you can fix those individually in a, in a model or you can fix them in the APR and it will then put that data back into the Revit model. But it, does, it doesn't, right now it's not set up to provide those color templates, but it does add all the data parameters into the objects. But, but we keep adding to the software. If there's something you'd like us to put in it, we will. So uh, to generate, you know, to guide one through those visualizations would be uh, something we have planned and, and we're going to ask. But um, if we've got time for any one more or something, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any 
So the question is how we're dealing with chapter 11. Uh, I think at this point, what what we're, I think we're on, what are we in, on? four or five years to get to this point? Yeah. So it's, we haven't, we haven't addressed that one yet, but there's so, so others we haven't addressed either. But I think at this point, the, the labor that we've done to get to this point will make something like that a little, will make it a little bit easier, believe it or not. Right. So at this point where it was, it's an enormous amount of effort to get all of that information, all of that programming done to talk back and forth with Revit, to put the parameters in that are needed to do the evaluation, to spit back a report that tells you, you know, I think we generated a thousand page report on one of the small buildings we designed, that tells you all the things just in those four chapters we look at. So we're, we're getting there. I haven't got there yet. So, so I, I would ask you guys to, to contact us you can download the software and try it out for free. Uh, give us some feedback. We're in the stage where um, where we want feedback from real real architects and designers uh, about the software, and we can work very closely with you um, to uh, answer your questions one on one. That's how we're doing it now. But um, so, uh, if you got questions today, please uh, please talk to us. That'd be great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark and James. So, uh, next uh, topic.